But let's go to number five, which is uh, interesting. The dramatic, I did talk about this one a little bit yesterday. The dramatic action of Die Walküre is largely determined in a series of three big confrontations. Fricka Wotan, Sigmund Brunhilde, Brunhilde Wotan. In which one character succeeds in convincing the other to change his or her mind and, and by, thereby significantly alter their subsequent actions. In Siegfried, on the other hand, there are a series of confrontations in which no one's mind is at least seemingly changed although their subsequent actions might possibly be. Can you name them? And I, I say I can think of at least nine examples. And then is there one scene where someone does change his or her mind, and when does the change occur, and what causes it? You guys have had all this time to think about it, so I expect some answers here. Excuse me? Alberich? Okay. Okay, that's one. One, when they don't change their mind. That's right. Mima, Mima says to Alberich, all right, you keep the ring, but let me have at least the Tarnhelm. And Alberich says, you idiot, I wouldn't give you, you, know, you drop dead. Okay, so that's, that's, that would, that's, that's one. Yeah? Yes. That's the one, of course, where he changes her mind. The one where, the, the only confrontation, Brunhilde and Siegfried. Sieg, uh, Brunhilde tries to convince Siegfried that he should love her, she's always loved him, and that he should love her um, um, as, as a goddess. And, and he says, no, the only way I can love you is a human. I mean, that's, I'm summarizing baldly here what happens in the scene, and he does change your mind. Uh, do we know when that is? I know I've played this for you before, but you, um, 10 years ago you would never remember. See, I personally think there is an absolutely specific moment, which unfortunately it, it, the, the stage director in Copenhagen didn't ask me, because he, he anticipated it. Uh, um, um, you know, first thing, of course, people's, it, it certainly could be argued, and I would agree with it, actually, that all along, really and truthfully, Brunhilde, um, it, it, or not, maybe not from the very moment she wakes up, but very quickly afterwards, I think she's, the, the, the um, stirrings of physical desire are present, but she doesn't want to admit to them. She still thinks of herself as a goddess. And she is bona fidely afraid and bona fidely um, uh, uh, horrified uh, when, 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 when Siegfried tries to embrace her. And her little, little vignette, her little aria, this... Um she paints this very beautiful scene of a kind of a pure, innocent love, and he would, she would be a, a mother figure and all. Is in a, in a way, what, what uh, you could call a rear guard action. She doesn't really believe it anymore. She's trying to convince her, it's a little bit along the lines of what Wotan was doing with, with Erda, that he doesn't really believe, he knows deep down, but anyway, um, be that as it may, um, she's still trying to fight him off. And, and his, his only response to this beautiful vignette is um, to say, dich lieb ich, o liebst du mich. I love you only if you only loved me. Uh, he doesn't get it. <laughs> and, and we have some of this, this, this wonderful... Uh, <laughs> very complex, and some of the only sexy music in this scene. I think this is definitely sort of sexy music, uh, of sort of, you know, panting in a way that, that, that so much of Tristan does and some of the first act of the Valkyra does. Okay, so he says, wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up, and she says, and, and with deep inner feeling we have this... Oh, Siegfried, I have always been yours. That's her answer to him. And this, by the way, this motif, this... Along with... Are the two main love motives of the Siegfried and Brunhilde. Uh, um, um, in the final analysis, the, 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 this one is the one that, that Simon calls the, the, the great leap, or the leap, yeah, the, the leap of faith. Um, um, in any case, it would seem to have something to do with Brunhilde and Siegfried's love as, as kind of a new extension of Wotan's idea. Um, uh, and there are, and we're, um, this one doesn't, although I think this one is very full of Wotan too, but I, that's, that's for another lecture. Um, but in any, in any case, this motive is what she sings this to.
sehr innig, deeply. And then Siegfried goes immediately back to his panting. All his stuff. Um, he's, not, he's not interested. And the very next phrase she sings, the very next phrase she sings after his... So instead of going, which it's done the previous 80 times over the last 20 pages, I mean, that's, this is the motive that dominates most of the scene, he does instead, um, which of course is the, the, the motif, you know, Du bist Lens, it's the basic love motif. He says, you're uh, dein werde ich ewig sein. Before she says, I was always yours, now she says, I will always be yours. And the, the music changes from, to and, and, and to me, to my ears, the fact that Wagner, this whole scene has been trying to tra sort of transform this new love motive into the old love motive, or to incorporate the old love motive into this new love motive. And, and that old love motive is, is qu quite explicitly um, associated with sexual love, um, and uh, um, in, in lots of different ways. But in any case, I think this is the place. And it's very interesting because Siegfried doesn't notice it. He goes on bu bu bubbling for quite a long time. And the next time she asks, basically, is when she says, aren't you afraid of this, this ravenous woman? In other words, she's turned into this openly sexual woman. So I think this is the, the, the spot. It's not important. This is just, I always thought this was, whoops, Wagner was quite specific here. You can still hear me. Um, that this was the actual spot. Does anybody want to try to find the other confrontations where people's minds aren't changed? There's one. Very good. The place that's certainly one. That's two. So we had um, um, Mima trying to get Albert to give him the Tarnhelm. We have uh, Wotan, I think, quite in jest, really, making fun of Albert, trying to get uh, Fafner to give up the. Uh, um, um, the, the horde. He says, if you give me the ring, then, you can, then I'll protect you and, and he'll leave you alone. Also, another one, for instance, I'm just going to make it faster here. Uh, I'd like to get to the next part. For instance, um, Mima tries to get the Vondra to go away. You know, I mean, what the whole first part of the Vondra scene consists of Mima saying, I don't need to know anything. I know everything I need. Useless knowledge is, 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 is a waste of time. Go, go away, Vondra, you know, etc. Yeah? That's much more, and that's the most significant. Votan tries to get Air to, to tell him, and, 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 and she doesn't. And, she, um, um, and actually, it's very interesting. That's, a, that's an amazingly complex scene because, um, okay, first, she says, Why do you bother waking me up? Why don't you wake up Brunhilde? And then, of course, he says, uh, Well, because Brunhilde is useless now because she's, she's also asleep. Um, um, and, and one of the things that's so great in, in the third act of Siegfried is we have this sleep scene where she's put back to sleep, and then we have its counterpart, this, uh, the awakening scene, which is maybe the greatest scene, one of the very greatest scenes in the ring, I think musically and dramatically as well, when, when he wakes her up. So there's this kind of nice sort of balance dramatically between the, 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 the two moments. Um, yeah, and, and, and just, the, the, there's a funny scene because and even then she doesn't ever respond. She just basically accuses him um, and, and a very important series of, 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 of you, you know, in other words, and what she accuses him has nothing to do with her, has everything to do with Brunhilde. It says, you are, you, you are punishing her for doing what you want. You stirred it up and then you punish her for it. You, you know, you, you are a god of lies, basically. She says, I don't want to have anything to do with it. I want to go back to sleep. So she doesn't even, she doesn't even try to answer his question. She, you know, she completely rejects it. And, and, and the series of music that, that she uh, uh, sings, we'll hear again in the ring, almost identical. Anybody tell me where? An almost exact re repeat of Erda's big reproach to Wotan. I'm calling it that, the, the reproach to Wotan. Anybody know when we hear it again? Almost all of it completely exactly the same. Same key, too, actually, um, or same keys. Uh, in the immolation scene, in, in, in Brunhilde's farewell to Wotan, when she... Um, she also is reproaching Wotan, but then she comes to peace with him at the end of it. But she pretty much repeats exactly what Erda says. Um, don't forget, all this repeating stuff, musical form is based entirely on repetition. Repetition and variation is what musical form consists of. If you don't have repetition, 
uh, you have no form. So it's very important, these, these moments where Wagner uh, repeats something in a new context, it's, it's not only that it's the same, but it makes us think about what it meant before and what it means now. It's you know, the compare and contrast, the passage of time, all these things. Uh, so the, 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 the ring is just absolutely, totally replete. Um, and it's especially important, essential in the ring that there be these moments because we're dealing with 15 hours of music, four different evenings, you know. So the listener has to have ways to bridge um, on all this enormous amount of music. Okay, let's go on to the musical part. Um, the first one is something that I talked about yesterday and stopped. So we'll, I'll go back to it. In the, if you remember in the um, scene with the, the Wanderer, during the formula that's, that precedes every single question, we have any, any question at all. We have, well, here's one I just, this is not the one I intended to come to, but this is just as good as any other one. Um, um, that's not the, the clearest one. That's clear as too clear. Well, when Votan even st starts his questions, he sings. We hear it there, but uh, in the earlier questions, it's perhaps a little clearer. Uh, I'll play the whole formula. This funny scale going up, it's the Vonder's music, and now this. That um, little frag, which we hear um, at all six questions, both when Votan's um, asking the questions and then when, when Votan is, um, and before when Neem is asking the questions. And so the, the, the question I ask here is, um, have we heard it before, do we hear it again later, and can we think of any significance to it? And Melody pointed out that we have heard it before. We've heard it as a uh, hunding. You know, high this is mine head. High this idea of mine house. It's the same as this, exactly same rhythm, same notes. And the, and the question scene. So it's the same as, it's, it's part of, 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 and also actually, of course, when, when Wotan kills hunding, we hear it again. Uh, um, um, he says, "Go, gehin knecht knia for flicker," and then is gay, gay, and he falls, he drops dead. Uh, um, so, but that's just a, a mirror of of, of of Hunding's thing. So we hear it here, we hear it in Hunding. So before we get to the significance, do we hear it again in the ring? Yeah. No. Don't think so. Um, anybody else? We certainly do hear it. Well, we hear it. <laughs> we hear it. Well, there's one very mysterious place we hear it, which I'm not going to. I'll go to in a second. We, um, what about? Does anybody remember this scene? What the scene is? Where's this from? What? Yes, yeah, Gunter and. No, who's? What's happening? This is a very, very specific moment in the ring. Yes, it's the Blood Brotherhood Oath, right? Okay, it goes on. The spear, okay. I don't have the score with me, so. They sing for a while about how good the vote is, and then it's, it stops, and then we hear. Break the brother the oath, the other brother our blood. What now it flows merrily will flow in torrents of revenge. And in Good Dameron, we hear this a ton, most uh, noticeably when, 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 when um, the, the vassals say, and the audiences always stupidly laugh, Hagen, was tatas do? What did you do after he kills Siegfried? And he says, I have repaid um, uh, uh, lying. Uh, uh, what are we, what's 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 the jur uh, perjury? I have repaid perjury, and he says he says to this. And it's usually it's called sometimes very poetically the atonement clause in the in the blood brotherhood. In other words, it's the part of the blood brotherhood that says what happens if you break it. What you break it is you, you die if you break the blood brotherhood. So it's but it's part of the blood brotherhood. So it's so we, this this particular phrase is three things in the ring. It's 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 um, hunding, uh, saying you know uh, my house is holy. 
uh, you can, my, my Herod is holy, you, you keep it um, holy. Um, then, um, in this, in the, as part of the question riddle, uh, in, in, um, in the bond we're seeing with Mima, and then finally, as part of the blood brotherhood oath, the sort of the, 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 the bad side of the blood brotherhood oath. Um, there is one other time, but I'll come there in a second. So, w w anybody think of any reason why? Just, just for grins? The, the whys make less difference. It's, I'm more interested in what, what the music is, but you can't help but wonder why. It's not by accident. Not this case. This is, this is, this is all real, obvious, and repeated, in all cases repeated many, many times. So, any, no, no, no theories. You know, can't think of anything in common between these places. Hunding, what's Hunding doing? He's setting up the rules. Right? Here's the rules. You know, you're a guest, you can sleep in my house. You can sleep for one night at my house, because those are the rules. Tomorrow I'll come kill you. Okay, those are the rules. Okay. Um, um, uh, this is the riddle scene. These are the rules of the riddles. We set the questions down, you answer the questions. You don't answer the questions, you lose your head. And what, what's, what's happening to Good or He says, we're making blood brotherhood. The blood brothers are faithful to each other. If they're not faithful, they're, they're what, the prick we have today will now be floods of, of death. So it's, it's, in a way, kind of ironically all the same. I, I always think of it as the rules, just you call it the leap of faith, I call this the rules of the game. Uh, um, because in all cases, and it's very, very ironic. Now, the purpose of why Wagner's doing this, I think has to do with what we talked about before, of creating connections. C it connects uh, 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 something in, 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 in very specifically in Die Valkyra, with something very specifically in Siegfried, to something very specifically in Gutterdammerung. And also, it, the way it connects them, in, in, in Valkyra, which is a very palpable, concrete opera of very human relations, uh, it, it, it's, it's very, you know, this, this is the rules of hospitality. And Siegfried, which is, of course, a, a great comedy, it's the rules of a, of a, of a riddle game. In Gutterdammerung, it's, you know, taken on to the sort of big tragic things. It's the blood brotherhood. It has sort of this blood and thunder a grand opera uh, a feeling, which, of course, is just very typical of Gutterdammerung. But, but I think that that's... That's, that's my answer. Anyway, okay. So next. Okay, this is, why do we hear the music associated with Brunhilde asleep uh, um, uh, when Siegfried responds to Mima's description of fear? That's actually, we hear it more than that. Um, but, okay, the music, I'm, what the music I'm talking about is... Um, we hear over and over and over again at the end of Valkyra, of course, uh, and we hear it um, also when Ziffy goes to the fire and we, when he's discovering uh, the, it's all associated there very strongly in our minds with, 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 with Brunhilde being asleep. It's, by the way, the same. Anybody know what, what that music also is? Just, just, this is not part of the question, but just... What if I change the rhythm and go... that? That's the sleep, right? That's, of course, the Rhine Maidens. And what about... Um, it's the Forest Bird. So the Rhine Maidens, the Forest Bird, and Brunhilde Sleep all have the same music. Um, we, we, I, I don't want to talk about right now why I think that is. Um, but, but they do. Anyway, that's the music of, of, of the sleeping Renilda, and, and, and we, that's, that's a clear association. There's no, there isn't any, I mean, we, can't, we can't help but have that association. Whatever name, it's called the sleep motive or various things. I don't really care what it's called, but we, we all very clearly have that association. Okay, so now, um, first thing, let's go. When Mima, Mima is describing to Siegfried what fear is, He's, and you know he has this this, this thing, and, and it's one, one very interesting thing. So we hear first thing the music he describes a fear to is a variant of is the is the magic fire music. Now I guess that the magic fire music would be used for a depiction of fear is not so far fetched, since um, the magic fire seems to depend upon fear as its vehicle. You, you fear the magic fire, and therefore you can't go through it. And Siegfried can go through it because he doesn't fear it, I suppose. Anyway, but in Mima's version, it's, 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 it's amazing. It's those chords. It's, 
it's, it's nightmarish chords. The chords have all been altered in a very nightmarish way. Of course, Mima is, 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 is really, really very nightmarish. And then in the midst of this, we start hearing this. And now Siegfried answers, boy, it must be wonderful, this fear stuff. Now we hear the fire music with the right harmonies. And it's very shimmering. It sounds particularly beautiful. And Siegfried says, my heart beats firmly in its chest. I don't understand this, this wonderful feeling you're talking about. But this, of course, is as clear. Before, in Mima's Nightmare, we had a distorted version of the sleep motive. But now we have it absolutely, unquestionably clear. And, and, and uh, Siegfried sings, Zondelich Zelza muss das sein. It must be awfully wonderful. And yet, heart and fest fühle ich steht mir das Herz. Okay, that he, that he, he, doesn't, he doesn't feel this. Um, so why, why does Wagner use the sleep motive as this metaphor of fear? It's foreshadowing. Yeah, exactly. That's, what fear is look like when Siegfried That's right. When this, when, exactly. Siegfried first feels fear because of the sleeping Brunhilde. Exactly. It's just foreshadowing. It's not, it's, this is not a difficult question. But anyway, that's the right answer. Thank you. Okay, next. What is the origin and significance of the main theme of the Wotan Erda scene? Anybody can remember what the vote the main what I'm referring to here? Well, when Votan, we hear it all over the scene, but let's go to the beginning. Uh, Votan walks on stage and starts calling her to wake up. That's of course the spear motive, and this is fate, supposedly. That's what I call, he sings, Vala, Ervach, you know, Erda, uh, Vala, uh, um, that's another name, wake up, the yam, ba, 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 yam. That's the sort of, it's all through this scene. And, and it's the last thing we hear in the scene, too, as, as he puts her to sleep, or no, well, she, he doesn't put her to sleep, she puts herself to sleep, we hear, uh, pop, uh, So that's right, that's the end of the scene. So it's both the beginning and the end and all through the scene. This. So what is that? Love motive again, right, exactly. Do this, do this, I mean. It's now just very, so yum, pa, yum. In a very sort of heroic uh, or dynamic, let's call it, a, a very dynamic form. Um, um, very, very clear. I mean, there's no, it's not disguised in any way at all. Um, um, it's never been, no, I've never seen any commentary ever mention this, even though it's not disguised. Probably because uh, the commentaries usually, I think, fall into the trap of, of starting with the explanation and then do, using the, the material, rather than starting with the material and then trying to make the explanation. They don't know why Wagner would uh, use this use a version of the love of the basic love motive in the ring as the motive of this scene, so they just they don't see it because they're not looking for because they don't they're not looking for it if that makes sense. Um, I I just look at the music and then figure out uh, if I can figure out what I think it means so much the better. But the music is what it is, and this is clearly the same music. I mean, there's a you, you hear it right. 
Du bist. It's usually, actually, there is a slight change of a one note, but it depends, and it's, it's, it's the same rhythm, same harmonic context, everything is very, very much the same. Any idea why? Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. It's through love that he got her. I think it's really important. I think that the basic uh, uh, overriding factor in the scene of the relationship between Wotan and Erda is marked by the fact that they were, they were lovers, and she at least loved him. By the way, in a much more hidden version, the scene between Wotan and Fricka is also marked by that. But that's, I won't go into that now, but also by a form of the same love motive. In that case, much more hidden. But Fricka, I assume that Wotan and Fricka loved each other at one time, and Fricka certainly still loved Wotan, um, at least um, in, in Act Two of Die Valkyra. And, and Erda certainly once loved Wotan, too. Okay, let's go to, um, I'm going fast because I, 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 I have a new question that I want to ask before, before we leave. Um, okay, what is the origins and significance of the motive of Brunhilde's awakening? We actually talked about this yesterday. And then it goes for a long time with the harps, and then it does. And we hear it twice through there. First when she wakes up, then when she sings to it and greets the, the sun and the light. Then we hear it at the beginning of Guru Damarung, one, one half step lower. This is the very beginning of Guru Damarung. Instead of having the harps, it has this, this sort of nature music. And, and then we hear it when Siegfried remembers Brunhilde and greets her in death. There's a, there it's a straight playback of when Brunhilde wakes up. Um, and so I just, the, the question is, what is the origin and significance of this theme? Well, I mean, it's a significance. And we said this yesterday. This, this was all. So if you guys can remember 24 hours, you can remember the answer. It's the same music as the Tarnhelm motive, slowed down enormously. It's the same as... Just ex enormously expanded. And, and the significance, of course, it, they both have to do with, with transformations, with change of state, with something. I mean, it's... it's um, it's, it's also, don't forget, Wagner is trying to have a unified score. Well, we talked about that yesterday also, that Wagner is very much in the uh, f follower of, of the medieval theorists who said that for a work of art to have life, it must be like all living things in which every cell is related in some way to every other cell. And so by having the, the, Brunhilde, the music that Brunhilde wakes up be a variant of the Tarnhelm is very much... Uh, in, in accord with, with this philosophical thing. So, okay, we, number 10 was the, the subject matter of my first talk. So I'm going to eliminate question 10 and ask another question instead. And that is a very simple question, really, is that can you tell me um, motives in the ring that you associate with specific instruments? Motives or characters or other things that you associate. We don't talk nearly enough about the orchestra in the ring and the instruments in the ring. Uh, uh, in my opinion, the best thing that I ever did for the Washington Society was the seminar we did on Wagner's orchestra that day at that place in Chinatown. And um, um, so this is just a, a simple question. It, can you give me any examples of any music motives or whatever in the ring that you associate with specific instruments? Yes, perfect start. Siegfried's horn call, we call it that even, is almost always played by the horn. And Siegfried is associated very much with the French horn. And the horn, we call it French horn in English, but it's just the horn. Um, uh, the horn is the woods instrument. It's, uh, 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 it's since time immemorial been associated with the woods, outdoors. Uh, it was a natural instrument. In other words, it was, it was an instrument that uh, was not mechanical. It, uh, it had no mechanical parts originally. Um, theoretically, you could play Siegfried's horn call on a, uh, at least the first part of it, on a natural horn. Um, never have heard that, but you could do it. So that's a yes? Yeah, at least we first hear it's the sword theme and the trumpet. Yeah, I think the trumpet is associated with the sword enormously. Now, we do hear occasionally the sword motive played by something else. Yeah. Uh, but the sword motive, which we first hear... And once again, like um, the horn, um, the, 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 a natu the trumpet is also an ancient instrument in its original form, didn't have, didn't have keys. It was just it was like a bugle would be today. And this is 
Those are all the notes that that's perfect for it. It, would, that you could, it could have been played on an ancient trumpet just as well as on a modern one. Um, it fits its whole character. And the trumpet has a great association, certainly, with heroism. Also, with, with, um, with uh, earlier on, had also seen with pomp and circumstance, which is not the case here. But certainly, it's a very heroic, uh, a silvery sound and, and, and fits it. That's a very good example. Yes? What's associated with? Yes, but what's the, what's the instruments associated with it? Yeah, bass tuba, usually double, and, and, and um, based the lore of the Wagner tubas and then, con and then the normal tuba. Always played by that, pretty much. It's almost always played in octaves, so he has to have two, two guys play it. The lower line is played by normal tuba, the, the, the upper line is played by the other tuba. That's just a sound effect, but once again, you're right, it's almost invariably associated with the sound of tubas. Yes? The clarinet One of the birds is almost always played by the clarinet. One of the bird calls, this one, is associated very strongly with the clarinet. There, there are three basic bird calls. Well, there's the, the, the one she later sings, which is what she sings, is, you know. That one is associated mostly with the oboe, actually. And, and uh, this one is associated with the clarinet. The other sort of birdie sounds that are not actually specific calls like, that one is associated with the flute. Um, um, there, there's, there's a lot of history behind this particular association. Of course, th this is sound effects again, they sound right. But, but it, can anybody think of uh, a piece of music that Wagner knew very well in which the composer has explicitly identified birds with these three instruments, clarinet, oboe, and flute? Beethoven's Pastoral Symphony, the end of the second movement? where he has cuckoo, nightingale, and what's the other bird? Can't remember. <sighs> anyway, and they're, he, they're played by these three instruments also. Wagner would have known this. I mean, this is part of Wagner's DNA. I mean, this is, and so the, the very, that's a very good answer. It's a very, very uh, a definite association. With, with the, and this one is, is very much associated with the, with the clarinet. Um, yes? For the giants, there's a compliment. Uh-huh. Yeah, the timpani. I mean, there's other instruments involved, too, but more than anything else, it's the timpani, right. And, and, when, and when, of course, the giant is turned into a dragon, it's still timpani, but now it's... It's become a set of... It's changed from a fourth, which is sort of healthy sounding and natural, to a tritone, as instead of this, which, which sounds somehow wrong. I, you can't say it sounds exactly evil necessarily, but it certainly sounds wrong. I mean, listen again to the difference between that's the giants, that's 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 the dragon. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, sure. The 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 the, the hammer itself, the the the. Ch -ch -the they play, they're anvils actually, and they're actually hitting anvils in, in, in uh, Rheingold, and he's hitting anvil like things also in the first act of Siegfried. That's certainly. Um, yes? Uh huh? <laughs> That's the Hunding theme. It is definitely associated with one instrument. Which instrument is it? It's absolutely associated with one instrument. No. Almost, is it ever played by the trombones? I don't know if it's ever played by the trombones. It might be, but it's played by the Wagner tubas, by the four Wagner tubas, absolutely. The, the hunting motive is associated absolutely with the Wagner tubas. And, and now, the Wagner tubas are a very special case. Let's, I'm going to delay anybody else for a second to expound a second on the Wagner tubas. Because, of course, the Wagner tubas are one of the three instruments in the ring orchestra which was invented by Wagner. I mean, and there's two different Wagner tubas, there's four players, there's two tenor tubas, two bass tubas, they're played by, they're, we call them tubas, but they're not tubas, they're horns. They're a variant of the French horn, and they're played by horn players. They, they, they're different from the French horn. French horn, first thing has its uh, bell goes backwards, and the Wagner tubas, their bell goes out this way. Um, and there's other differences too. And they have a, 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 a more focused and, and more heroic sort of sound, less woodsy, more heroic. And it's maybe perhaps darker sound. Um, which this darker sound certainly comes to play in, 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 in this motive. Can 
anybody give me any other motives in the ring associated with the Wagner? Oh, what are the other instruments that Wagner invented for the ring, by the way? No, bass clarinet is a very, very important instrument. We'll get to it in a second. But Wagner does not, did not invent. The bass clarinet already existed. And the bass clarinets, all of his greatest uh, repertoire is written by Wagner, either in the ring or in Tristan. But there is, an, there is an instrument that Wagner invented in the ring that starts with bass. Invented by, we, we underestimate Wagner's importance as an in, instrument inventor. Or he had people invent them for. He went with his ideas and designs and had technical people. The bass trumpet. Bass trumpet plays an enormous amount in the ring. As a matter of fact, it plays far more than the real trumpet does. Uh, um, it plays a great deal in the ring. The bass trumpet is sort of a, a large instrument like this with keys. And in America, it's always played by trombone players. And in Europe, it's always played by trumpet players. Um, um, don't, don't ask me why. This is one of those things that I really, I just know that it's true, but I don't know why. Um, the, the bass trumpet player at the, at the Met right now is sensational, fantastic player. Best player in the whole orchestra, practically. And the bass trumpet has a million solos in the ring. Um, mostly the same music the trumpet would have. Uh, uh, in other words, it doesn't have motives that I associate with it so much as that it, it, it for instance, it very often plays the sword motive, just as the trumpets do, but in a low, but in a low register. And, 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 and sort of, you know, sort of with a different kind of effect. Um, so that's, that's Wagner tuba's bass trumpet. Any other instrument? This other one is a little more obscure that Wagner also invented. Oh, the steer horns. Yeah, the steer horns Wagner didn't invent, though. The steer horns, which there's one in Valkyra and three in, in Gutterdämmerung, those are, those are natural instruments. They're alpine horns. They're supposed to have sort of a crude, uh, unrefined sound, which they do. Um, and they used to always be played by trombones, but nowadays, um, in many productions, they have bothered to get the real instrument. But Wagner didn't invent those. He just uses them. The first composer I know to use them. But this is another one that he invented. It's an, like, just as the Wagner tubas are a variant on the French horn, and the bass trumpet is a variant on either the trumpet or the trombone, th this other one is also a variant of a, of a pre-existent instrument. Anybody have any idea? What? It's not a horn, no. It's not a horn. It's a trombone. It's the contrabass trombone. The, the, the trombone section in the ring consists of four trombones. The three normal trombones, two tenor and a bass, and then a contrabass trombone, um, which is this huge trombone which requires an absolutely extraordinary amount of wind on the person who plays it. Uh, um, uh, and it was invented for the ring. Whereas, uh, okay, does any other composer ever use Wagner tuba? Can anybody tell me anything other than the ring that uses Wagner tubas? Excuse me? Bruckner, right. Bruckner Symphony 7, 8, and 9 all have Wagner tubas. Anything else? Mahler never uses Wagner tuba. Uh, uh, Richard Strauss, uh, uh, Elektra. Elektra, Alpine Symphony, uh, 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 Frau und Schatten all use Wagner tubas. Um, yes, that's correct. Okay, what about bass trumpet? Anybody tell me anything other than the ring that uses bass trumpet? This time, Bruckner is not, doesn't use a bass trumpet. Stravinsky does, though, in The Rite of Spring, very prominently, actually. Um, and once again, Strauss in Salome and Elektra in Frau Neschatten uses a bass trumpet. Alpine Symphony uses a bass trumpet. And the contrabass trombone, I don't think anybody else ever uses it again. I mean, somebody must have. But, um, but, but it has a very characteristic part in the ring. One of the reasons Wagner invents it, Wagner was interested in having these choirs of instruments. So there are four horns, there's four Wagner tubas, and there's three trumpets plus a bass trumpet, so that's four trumpets, and there's three trombones plus a contra bass trombone, that's four uh, trombones. There's, each of these have sort of choirs, and then there's the normal tuba, which is sort of by itself. There's, um, um, and, and as I said, we call Wagner tubas tubas, but they're horns, they're not, they're not theoretically tubas. Uh, I'm, I'm not an expert. I don't. I couldn't. If you ask me what is the, the theoretical difference, I couldn't tell you. All, all I know is that horn player, anybody who can play the French horn, can play the Wagner tuba. Maybe very badly, but they can play it. Um, so let's go back now to my question: so, uh, inst uh, music that's associated with instruments. We're talking about the Wagner tubas. We've, we've established that the hunting motive is associated with Wagner tubas. Anybody else? Anything else associated with Wagner tubas? I know the time is just about up. You, if you have to leave, leave. They, 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 okay. Yeah? Sound recollection tells me the Tarnhelm is pretty consistent. Tarnhelm is played? And who plays? Who You're absolutely right. Who plays the Tarnhelm? What plays? The Tarnhelm is this. Yeah. 
you might even tell me it's four instruments playing it, um, the four of the same kind. It's, it's French horns with mutes. It's muted horns, very, very specific sound, very, very special sound. But uh, what, about, um, um, what about the Valhalla motive? Who plays the Valhalla motive? Almost always. Yes, there are one or two instances where somebody else plays it. But 95% of the time, the, this, this. It's played by one particular instrument or four of this instrument. Wagner tubas again. It's very interesting that Wagner tubas are associated with Valhalla and they're also associated with Hunding. And the, the, the characteristic sound, there's two sides to the, the coin, as it were. Wagner tubas are associated with something else as well. Very much so, actually, the very first time in the history of music that Wagner tubas are heard, they're heard uh, as the uh, harmonic foundation for this, for this motive, the, the, the renunciation motive. The, the. That, those chords underneath are the Wagner, that's the first time Wagner ever uses them, is when, when she sings that. So there's very definitely an association. This is a huge subject. I don't know, how, what, what time am I supposed to stop? Now, now? okay. <laughs> <laughs>